Our second speaker is Chris Budd who, uh, from University of Bath who will be speaking about chaos from celestial mechanics to climate, uh, a nice small project to be getting on with. Well, thank you. Well, it's a, it's a really great pleasure to be here at this wonderful conference and uh, marvellous first talk. Um, I actually did my PhD in Oxford and I was a, a research fellow in Oxford. And I think it's correct to say that it was whilst I was studying at Oxford that I was introduced to chaos. <laughs> um, I'm also slightly perturbed to hear from the last speaker that chaos is the ultimate source of all evil. Um, but anyway, I'm going to talk a bit more about the mathematical side of chaos and take a kind of a historical view on how chaos was discovered and look at some of the applications of it, in particular in celestial mechanics and in climate. Um, but I'm going to start with a question. And the question is, is life predictable or unpredictable? You know, a very important and deep question. So I think it's reasonable to say on a human scale that life is pretty predictable in a second from now. Yep, we're still here. <laughs> OK, we can probably say, I hope you won't run out, that in an hour's time you'll still be in this lecture theatre. So we can predict that in an hour's time. We can predict the weather pretty accurately an hour into the future. But at the same time, what can we predict about what's going to happen in a year's time? Well, obviously, I can't predict anything about us individually, but probably this building will still be here in a year's time. Um, but the essence of chaos theory, in a sense, is how well we can predict things into the future, and it is hard to predict everything, especially into the future. Um, and this essentially lies at the heart of what science is. So if you want to predict into the future, we have to ask, does nature have an underlying order and pattern? And I'm going to sort of have some good news, and then some bad news, and then we go back to the good news. <laughs> so the good news is, yes, it does. And that is my definition of science. I know I'm surrounded by philosophers of science who may disagree with me, but I would argue that science is the search for order and pattern in the universe. I don't think that's an unreasonable definition. And if we look around, we can see order and pattern everywhere. Um, and a lovely example are snowflakes. And obviously no two snowflakes are the same, but all snowflakes have a wonderful order and pattern about them. They have degrees, six degree, this sort of lovely degree of symmetry associated with them. And anyone that can see that looks at that, will say, yes, there is something going on there to give that order and pattern. And of course, the, the one that goes right back, the harmony of the spheres, is the motion of the planets. And the Greeks and everyone looking at the cosmos could see that there were bodies that went round the Earth, as they thought, in a very predictable and regular way. And of course, it was those motions which then led people to be able to um, time things and know when to plant and everything else and you know in the bible it refers to the sun and the moon as lights in the star sky that we could order our lives by so this is very very ordered stuff so we know there's order out there we know there's pattern out there and that means that we can certainly go ahead and predict things um, and one of the first people to really realize this from a kind of scientific point of view uh, was galileo now, I'm a big fan of Galileo, both as a scientist and for the fact that we both have the same birthday. <laughs> okay, so um, we both celebrate the 15th of February uh, as our birthday. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, along with a few other dodgier individuals. Um, anyway, the story about um, Galileo was that um, he was a scientist, um, but he uh, was attending, uh, as he had to do, uh, a service in the cathedral in Pisa and whilst he was in there he had to listen to long boring sermons and my father was a clergyman I had to listen to a lot of sermons when I was there uh, and he did what I also used to do 
um, during the sermons, which was to do mathematics and science whilst pretending to listen. Don't tell my father. Um, anyway, um, what Galileo did during the sermon was he watched a chandelier swing to and fro. Um, and he realised, watching that chandelier to swinging to and fro, that it was governed by predictable laws. Now, sadly, we're not in an Oxford college. We don't have a chandelier available. But I do have this. Uh, here's my pendulum, which is rather like a chandelier. Um, and it swings to and fro, predictably, in the same way that the chandelier swung to and fro predictably. And Galileo timed the swinging of the chandelier with his pulse, and he realised that the time of the swing was constant. And it didn't depend what time of the day it was, it didn't depend what time of the year it was, and it didn't depend whether it was a, a, lar a large-ish swing or a small swing. It was always the same. Very, very predictable. And of course that predictability led later on with people like Huygens to the invention of the pendulum clock, exploiting that predictability. So there was Galileo, um, and rather neatly, Galileo died in about the same time that Isaac Newton was born, um, and Isaac Newton took Galileo's discoveries and he turned them into mathematics. So I'm actually an applied mathematician. I as I say, studied mathematics here in Oxford for my PhD. And Newton took um, the pendulum and wrote down equations describing it. So at this point, I, I issue the health warning for those in the audience of a nervous disposition, we're going to start looking at some mathematics. Okay. So here's our first equation, this wonderful thing. Um, there we are. This is a, a differential equation, second order nonlinear one of my favourites, um, which precisely, I spent my life studying these things, um, describes the motion of the pendulum. Okay. Um, there's good news and bad news again about this equation. Uh, the good news is it describes the motion of the pendulum. The bad news is that we can't solve it, um, even now. Um, the good news is you can solve it pretty well accurately, either using a computer or for small swings of the pendulum, and you can solve it exactly. Um, so that's the equation for the pendulum, and if you take that equation and solve it, you find that there are small swings which um, behave, so this is the angle theta, um, like this, and you can plot them out, um, and the period is the 2 pi root L over G, and you can, G being the acceleration of gravity, L being the length of the pendulum, and pi being pi, and, and if you plot, take all those values and plot it out, you can find that the period of the swing of the pendulum is exactly what Galileo was um, finding. Um, interestingly, a small joke here, um, square root of g, acceleration due to gravity in SI units, is very, 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 very close to pi. So you can actually eliminate pi from this and you just get 2 pi root L, um, which is close enough for government work. Um, so the, the swing of a one metre pendulum from one side to the other is almost exactly one second, which is rather nice. OK, so Newton came up with a very, very profound um, idea at this point. I think the most important idea that I can think of in science, um, others may disagree, which is that if you want to understand the universe, not just bits of it, but all of it, um, you write down equations. You write down mathematical equations describing the system. Um, you then solve the equations, and if you solve the equations, that predicts the future. And here's an example of a computer at uh, the Met Office, uh, which is used to do precisely that, to try to predict the weather into the future. So this is Newton's idea, and this idea has powered most of science, well, certainly the physical sciences, since if you want to understand something, you turn it into maths, you write down the equations, you study those equations, and that helps you understand what's going to happen. Okay. And that's been the basis of my entire career. Okay, so that's Newton's idea. Does it work? My goodness, it works well. 
Okay, so going back to the um, planets going around the sun, and we'll come back to this repeatedly, um, as well as uh, writing down equations for other things, Newton came up with the law of gravity, which um, is this. This is the saying that if you have um, a, a point, a, a particle, and a, and a big central body like the sun, um, then the acceleration of that particle towards the uh, um, body uh, is given by this formula here, um, and that's Newton's law of gravitation. And it doesn't depend upon whether you're a planet going around the sun or an apple falling to the, to the uh, floor. It's the same equation all the time. It even applies to galaxies and stuff like that. And Newton was able to kind of solve the system for that and predicted, um, although Kepler already found this experimentally, um, that a planet would go around the sun in an ellipse. And people checked this out and found that Newton's uh, predictions were absolutely dead on. And if you're just looking at planets going around the sun, you could exactly predict what was going to happen. And that worked fantastically well. OK, so you've heard about my birthday, the 15th of February. And my wife is in the audience, and her birthday is the 13th of March. Why is that important? Um, because in 1782, in my home city of Bath, William Herschel, the astronomer, on one of the very, very few days when it's not cloudy in Bath, pointed his telescope at the sky and found the planet Uranus. Okay, 13th of March, 1782. Discovery of the planet Uranus by William Herschel. And there it is on the left. Okay, there's Uranus. Um, and they looked at the orbit of Uranus and plotted it out and found something bizarre. It didn't obey Newton's predictions. It didn't obey Newton's predictions. Consternation. What was going on? Well, there were two possibilities. One was that Newton's theory was wrong, and the other was that something was causing Uranus to not quite agree with Newton's theory. And by that point, people were so confident <coughs> that Newton's theories were right that they looked for something which might cause Uranus to not um, obey Newton's laws. They postulated the existence of another planet. Um, and there were two people that uh, looked into this, John Couch Adams at St John's College, Cambridge, my old college, before I came to Oxford. I switched sides. Um, and uh, Le Verrier in, in Paris. And both of them calculated away and predicted the existence of a planet and where that planet would be. And there's the planet. It's the planet Neptune over there. Um, so uh, Le Verrier spoke to some German astronomers who went off and pointed their telescopes at the sky and found Neptune, yes. Uh, John Couch Adams spoke to some English astronomers who went off and had a good dinner and did not point their telescope at the sky, <laughs> and so the Germans beat us to it. Um, and here's a picture of John Couch Adams, and there's a telescope they didn't point at the sky to find Neptune. <laughs> okay. um, but the key thing about this was that the mathematical model that ne Newton had come up with, and which Couch Adams and Verrier, Le Verrier analysed, was good enough to predict something which no one knew about before. Really profound, and um, this has op you know, opened the, you know, our eyes to the power of mathematical modelling and what it can do. OK, so that's astronomy. This talks about um, celestial mechanics and climate. Um, so these are the equations here for the, the weather. Well, bits of the weather, anyway. We have one of the world's experts in weather forecasting in the audience, so I hope you forgive me uh, by uh, just putting up this lot. Um, but this is the, the fundamental equations that uh, are used to forecast the weather. And actually, weather forecasting is very good, providing you're about a few days into the future. Okay. This, this equation will predict the weather pretty well up to about a week ahead. Uh, and that um, modern-day weather forecasting is, is done by taking this equation, turning it in, into uh, um, kind of numbers, and then computing those on the computer and predicting. And that's how it's done. OK. Um, and it's worth saying, this is the 3rd of June, 
Okay, 79 years ago was the run-up to D-Day, and it was on that very day that possibly the most important weather forecast ever was made, and it was made by this guy, James Stagg, um, and he forecast that on the 5th of June there was going to be a storm in the channel and D-Day couldn't go ahead that day, it would have to be postponed. He said to Eisenhower, but using some data we've just got from Ireland, I can predict that the 6th of June will not be a storm and so Eisenhower moved the D-Day from the 5th of June to the 6th of June precisely because of the predictions of a weather forecast. So it's really important these things can change um, the, the world. Um, interestingly enough, and I hope this is not being too rude, the German meteorologists didn't predict it and got it wrong, and that's one of the reasons that they lost D-Day, and that really is true. So that's the most important weather forecast ever made. And it was made on the basis that certain things in science can be predicted. Um, and on the basis of kind of Newton's laws, uh, Laplace in 1814 uh, came up with um, what's now called Laplace's demon, um, which is the concept that the, the laws of nature were so good that there was no room left for anything else. You just have to write the equations down. He didn't have a computer then, but the concept is you could still predict forward from that and everything would be foretold. There'd be no room for free will. Everything's fine. Um, you know, well, not fine. You know, everything's laid out before us in this very predictable way. So that's the class's demon. Now, the point about this is that's all very well, but it doesn't seem to accord with our own experience. Okay. Um, we own a dog. That dog does stuff which cannot be predicted. Okay. <laughs> it's a spaniel. So does this sort of accord with our view of reality? Well, no, it doesn't. Lots of things in nature, and particularly anything involving human beings or spaniel dogs, seems to be very unpredictable. You know, our whole concept of luck is based on that. Okay, so this seems to be rather different from this kind of Newtonian conception of the universe. Um, so going back to the weather, well, that's possibly a reasonably good <laughs> forecast for the week after next. Um, the weather after a week cannot be predicted to any degree of certainty. Um, we can say general things like it's going to be hotter in the summer than in the winter, <laughs> but if you ask me or any weather forecaster to say well, precisely what the weather's going to be in, say, two weeks' time, we're not going to tell you the answer. You simply cannot do it. There's physical reasons why you can't do it, which I'll come back to in a minute. So, and we know there's that. Um, and so the question, the sort of philosophical question, I suppose, um, is, is nature at its very heart unpredictable? Are we simply wasting our time as scientists? Or does the unpredictability that we do see in things like the weather or, well, maybe not my dog, but, say, turbulence or cloud behaviour or anything like that um, arise because of some underlying complexity in, in the world or is it a natural consequence of the laws of nature? And the point about chaos theory is saying, well, some of the unpredictability, not all of it, but some of the unpredictability we see in nature is actually a natural working out of Newton's and other laws. Okay, and that's going to be the argument I'm going to take forward um, as I kind of develop then the theory of chaos. Anyway, we're going to do it by a practical demonstration to start with. So I was slightly cheating when I said that this was a pendulum, um, which was like a chandelier, because it isn't quite. Um, it's actually a double pendulum. The more observant of you might have noticed that. It's very like my leg. So here's my leg, right? Doesn't work quite so well now with the joints. But anyway, my leg does that sort of motion. Okay, it's got a bit there and a bit there. Um, and this has a bit there and a bit there. And uh, these two are coupled together. The, the bearings are pretty good. Um, there's very little friction in this. Um, and it's acted on by gravity. Um, and we've already seen that we get nice regular motion like that if I move it like that. Okay, that's what the pendulum is doing. And that motion 
is very, very predictable. I can write equations down for that and predict that very well. It has a slightly more exotic motion, which is this one. Okay, um, you'll see here that the top and the bottom are out of phase. Um, one's, when one swings one way, the other swings the other way. But still, we can predict that. I could tell you what the period of that was very accurately. But there is a third motion. And this is the fun one. <laughs> it's the same pendulum. I haven't changed it. There's no motors there. There are no hidden demons blowing it. There are no gods from whatever. Uh, it's just doing stuff. And this is chaos. This is exactly chaos. This is unpredictable and erratic motion coming from a simple mechanical system. Now, audience participation is always good. Um, there is a small amount of friction in the system, which means it loses energy, and after a while it settles down to a kind of state of <laughs> rest. Um, and we can kind of say when that happens, when we think the bottom bit's gone through the last top bit for the last time. And I think that's possibly where we've got to there. So we're going to use the audience to see whether we can predict this when I do it again. So what I'm going to simply do is swing it again and you have to clap if you think the bottom bit's gone through the top bit for the last time. With me on that? Shall we have a quick clap to make sure we know the idea? Okay. Great stuff. Okay. Um, so let's, let's do that. So all you've got to do is predict when you think the bottom bit's gone through the top bit for the last time. Isn't it wonderful? And so all is it's two bits of metal with um, good ball bearing. This is the very pendulum that was used in 2005 in the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures, <laughs> given by Marcus de Sotoy. But he used my pendulum, <laughs> with permission and thanks. OK, so here we go. How the, how's the clapping going? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Still hedging our bets, are we? Oh, thank you. Oh, you might be right. Oh, yes. Well done, sir. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's chaotic, unpredictable behaviour um, from our same system. So, oh, yeah, and there's a, there's a kind of plot if you plot a light and watch it, that's what it will look like. Okay, what is going on here? What is going on here is Newton's laws are still applying. Here's a double pendulum, it's got two bits of length L1 and L2, that has mass M1, that has mass M2, there are the angles um, for it, and with a bit of work you can write down the equation for this. I cheated, there's a wonderful guy called David Aitchison who's a professor in this very building who wrote a wonderful book called From Calculus to Chaos and the equations for this are in there and here they are. <laughs> wonderful. So these are the precise equations for the double pendulum. Well, without friction, but that's close enough. Okay, I know they're a bit scary, but, but they're not that bad. They're, they're two coupled second order nonlinear ordinary differential equations. Um, you can't solve these analytically apart from the case of small swings, but you can solve them numerically on a computer to essentially any desired of accuracy over a, over, over a period of time. And if you stick them on a computer, the computer does exactly the same as this. Um, so it, it essentially will either have that as a solution or that as a solution, and the computer does exactly the same thing. I, I won't do a computer demo, but suffice to say, if you want to have a look at it on a computer, there, there's an example. You can type double pendulum simulation into um, uh, Google, and there are plenty of simulators out there. So this motion actually arises from those equations. You might say, well, they look complicated. Well, they're nothing like as complicated as the equations for the weather, but um, they are still exactly describing 
that system. And here's a reasonable definition of chaos. Chaos is complex, irregular motion that arises out of the natural workings out of a simple system. Of a simple system. So not every solution of Newtonian physics is a planet going round in the sun in ellipse. <clears throat> and here we have a practical demonstration of that. So that is a reasonable definition of chaos. You can describe it, be more careful in mathematics and talk about the apennal exponents and stuff like that, but that's good enough for today, I think. We'll probably hear other definitions today. Um, and there are various outworkings of this. If you have complex erratic motion, it's very hard to predict into the future because you can start the pendulum off in two very, very close by states and they will evolve later on into two states which are very different. And this um, was um, um, uh, noticed by Lorentz, who we'll hear about in a minute, and called the butterfly effect with the idea that a butterfly flapping its wings in the Amazon could cause a, a tornado in, um, uh, in America a few days later. It turns out it has to be a pretty big butterfly to do that. But anyway, um, so we have this what's called sensitivity to initial conditions, the fact that you can have this difficulty prediction over, over time. And this is a partial answer to Laplace's <coughs> demon, that the demon could predict into the future, but it would have to know everything to within the width of an electron to be able to get anywhere. Okay. So that is that. Um, and there's lots of, if you want to sort of see some nice examples, uh, my children went to school at St Mary Redcliffe School in Bristol. Next to that is a church called St Mary Redcliffe Church. And there's a lovely thing called a water pendulum there, which is chaotic. You can go and see that. It, it, it's very like this, except it uses water. Um, and that's an example. Um, most of you, I imagine, have Wi-Fi at home, and you may have noticed that the patterns of your Wi-Fi are very unpredictable as you go around the house. Sometimes it can be really strong, then can be quite weak. Um, that's why. Um, so this is, um, if you look at a kind of a room like this and look at the way that the Wi-Fi signals bounce around in the room, um, you can get this very, very complicated pattern, which is called chaotic billiards. Uh, Michael Berry in the audience is a great expert on this. Um, but this is what your Wi-Fi looks like in a room, and it's very hard to predict because of, of chaos. So that's the kind of concept. This is the idea, then, that we can see irregularity in nature arising even though the laws of nature are well understood. So let's take you on a little tour through kind of how this was, I suppose, realised in, um, in the scientific community. Um, and arguably, the discoverer of chaos was this guy, Henri Poincaré, the amazing French mathematician who did vast amounts of wonderful things. Um, and <clears throat> he, in the late 19th century, um, was studying a thing, we've just heard about it from the a gentleman in the audience, uh, a thing called the N-body problem. What Poincaré was doing was he was uh, uh, entered a competition to look at whether the solar system that we had a look at earlier was stable or not. Now this is kind of important because if it's unstable, we all die. Okay. Um, and even if it's slightly unstable, you can get asteroids which hit us and we all die. Okay, so it is a very important thing. Um, and he was studying this um, in the 19th century. Um, and yeah, so the 1887 um, entered this competition. And it's really interesting um, what happened. Um, so he, he, was, he said, well, what is the solar system? It's a load of particles which are interacting with each other um, under gravity. Uh, this is called the N-body problem because you have N bodies. Um, and he realised that there were configurations which weren't predictable like a planet going around the sun in an ellipse. If you have more particles of some of comparable masses, they can have much, 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 much more complicated behaviour. Um, and here's a trajectory, and that's just of three particles. So he discovered this, um, and he discovered it without really the use of computers, by simple mathematical reasoning. Um, and here are the equations uh, for the three bodies, um, not dissimilar from the equations that we have for the double pendulum. Um, there's 
three second order rather than two second order. Um, and here is a simulation of kind of the three body problem. Um, and you can see those three simple equations have this very, very complicated behavior. And <clears throat> the Earth going around the Sun behaves in an ellipse, but the asteroids, which are interacting with each other, these bodies between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter, which are being pulled around by Jupiter and, and the Sun and, and themselves, um, some of them orbit in this really very complicated um, pattern like this. Um, and here we have a good example of chaotic behavior in celestial mechanics. Um, so as far as we know, there is no exact solution to the n-body problem, although there are some exact solutions in certain cases. Um, Poincaré studied these things using uh, things called Prunk, what are now called Poincaré sections and Poincaré maps. Um, these are the sort of patterns that you get when you do this. Uh, for those of you who like this sort of thing, um, what the n-body problem is, is an example of Hamiltonian chaos. Um, it's very, very similar mathematically to the double pendulum. Um, and this is a thing called a homoclinic tangle. Um, I'm going to say Poincaré worked all of this out uh, well before computers. Uh, very remarkable uh, piece of work. Okay. Um, where do we go next with chaos? Well, I, I would say uh, the next person to really study chaos uh, was this lady, Mary Cartwright, um, who was a fellow of Girton College in Cambridge. Um, and during the Second World War, uh, people were, were developing radar systems and uh, they were finding that some of the circuitry in the radar system was going f unstable in a funny sort of way, which no one really understood. Um, and they asked Mary Cartwright and Littlewood, who was a very famous and eminent mathematician in Cambridge, uh, to study this problem. Um, they wrote down this equation uh, to, to look at it, which is now called the Van der Poel equation. Um, and wrote this very important paper in 1945, um, which identified chaotic behaviour. They, they found that there was definitely, definitely chaotic behaviour. Of course, they didn't call it chaos at the time. Um, and that led to a redes redesign of our radar systems. Um, so arguably, um, Mary Cartwright is one of the uh, discoverers of chaos after Poincaré. Um, but the kind of the real explosion, as it were, in interest in chaos came due to this guy uh, called Ed Lorentz. Um, so we, I've already talked a bit about weather and a bit about climate. Um, and Ed Lorentz was a meteorologist, and he was trying to understand a convection in the atmosphere. And this is, you know, a very complicated thing, um, but by doing what's called a mode decomposition, he reduced the rather difficult study of convection down to the study of three ordinary differential equations uh, which are now called the Lorentz equations after him and here they are very famous set of equations uh, amongst mathematicians um, x y and z describe the atmospheric state um, rho sigma and beta are parameters uh, associated with how you're describing the, the convection so these are the Lorentz equations and he wrote these down in the 1960s. And he was lucky. Because before him we had Cartwright, before her we had Poincaré. Neither had access to what we call a fast computer. But in the 1960s, Lorentz did. So he had access to uh, fast digital computers um, and stuffed these onto the computer, pressed the button, and was staggered to find that the solutions of these did not seem to behave in any regular way. And they came up with these uh, weird solutions and he couldn't think of anything to call them and they were called chaotic as a result. So these are the Lorentz equations uh, for um, describing convection. So they're kind of like the weather but a, a, a simplified version uh, of the weather. Um, and here's a solution of the Lorentz equations. I'll try and explain. Um, in the yellow, we have a solution where we start everything off. Uh, we've got values for x and y, but we start with the x here uh, taking the value 1. And we get this kind of very complicated, weird behaviour, which is true chaotic behaviour. Um, if you start off slightly differently, 
um, with x uh, as 1 and uh, 10 to the minus 6, then the two solutions stay the same, but after about 26 units of time, they diverge completely. And we have this sensitivity to initial conditions. Um, and Lorentz got very, very excited because he felt that that reproduced what you see in weather forecasting. Okay. Now, I'm extremely conscious of the fact that I have the world expert on this subject, Tim Palmer, in the audience, so I hope I don't uh, get this wrong. Um, but here's an example of what's called an ensemble forecast, um, which is where you take uh, the current atmospheric state and you run it forward in time um, using the uh, weather models that the Met Office, or in this case the ECMWF, the European Centre for Medium Wage Weather Forecasting, have. And you run them forward in time, um, and uh, you know, there's various examples uh, of, of that. And you, then you slightly vary your initial conditions consistent, say, with the measurement error that you might normally make, and see what you get. And this is called an ensemble forecast. And the black lines show all the forecasts. You can see after about six days, the forecasts are broadly speaking giving you the same answer. But after uh, 10 days, they're all giving you very, very different answers. Um, and this is where they're doing what the Lorentz equations here are doing, displaying the sensitivity to initial data, um, which means this is basically why you can't forecast the weather accurately after about a week. It's built into, this, built into the system. Okay. And that's called an ensemble forecast, and these things are extremely important in, in the way we do our forecasting because they give us an idea of how um, reliable the forecast is and gives you um, probabilistic es estimates as to what's going on. But it's not all quite as bad as that. I mean, you might think, well, what's the point? You can't predict anything. Um, if you take the solutions of the Lorentz equations, x and y, we saw x as a function of time, and it was all over the place. But here is x and y plotted. Oops, sorry. And you get this really kind of nice picture here, which looks wonderfully like a butterfly. Um, and this is called a strange attractor. And this is something you see all the time in, in um, dissipative chaotic systems, where the system evolves in such a way that although, as a function of time, it's very unpredictable, the, the state, that's x, y, and z, lies on a set with much more predictable properties. And you can look at those properties, you can get what we call ergodic measures. You can get ideas of what will happen on average. And from a point of view on weather, that's good because it means we can predict climate. You can't, I can't tell you what on earth the weather's going to be a year ahead, but I can tell you it's going to be probably warmer than it would have been in January. And you can run climate models forward 100 years looking at average effects. And this is kind of because systems, even if they're chaotic, because they're obeying physical laws, are doing kind of predictable things. Um, and this, again, uh, can be used in weather forecasting. So here, again, is our initial condition with the uncertainty. Here's our ensemble. Um, but we can predict this kind of um, climatology, this general statistics about it. And that allows us to make predictions. Um, so we do see chaos in, in real climate. Uh, a lovely example is El Nino, um, which is the periodic cooling and warming of the southern Atlantic Ocean. And uh, you've got water going from uh, South America over to the Australia area and back again. Um, and you can write models down for El Nino, uh, differential delay equations for those of you interested in these sort of things. Um, and those models have chaotic solutions, um, and that's the actual uh, periodic cooling and warming of El Nino, which you can see has some regularity to it, but also is not as predictable as we'd like. And again, that's very characteristic of, of chaotic systems uh, with this kind of interplay of unpredictability and predictability. Um, and this is something we always have to be aware of making meteorological or indeed climatological <coughs> predictions going forward. Um, another way to study chaos, uh, this is very popular if you want to kind of do this on your home computer, uh, is through maps. Uh, this is called the logistic map, which takes a number xn, produces another number xn plus 1. 
Um, and this uh, has been studied very much. If you run this forward, um, the behavior depends on this number a. Um, this is the sort of behavior you get as a function of a. Um, if a is less than three, this settles down to a very simple system. Uh, and then you get what's called a period doubling, and then another period doubling leading to chaotic behavior with windows of, of regular behavior. Um, so that's a, 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 a map. We use these a great deal. Um, my personal interest is in um, maps which look more like this, uh, which I know. Uh, <laughs> I use this to study the ice ages, if anyone's interested. Um, and if you run that map forward in time, you get these wonderful patterns. Um, and um, these patterns, again, have a sort of mixture of order and chaos associated with them. And uh, we can use these to, to investigate things like the ice ages in, in climate and so on like that. OK, um, I'll just finish off with something which isn't particularly philosophical, but just a bit of fun. Uh, as I say, I've been studying chaos since I was in Oxford. Um, I do an awful, awful lot of work uh, in practical applications, particularly working with industry, um, you might say, well, what's the point of all this? Um, and chaos actually has surprisingly many practical applications. Um, these maps that we've seen here generate a lot of structure out of something very, very simple. Um, and nature seems to work like that a bit. Um, some of the structures that you see in nature seem to come from the iterations of simple things, and if you repeat that, you can do computer graphics. So this is an example of a fern called the Barnsley fern, um, which is produced by iterating a simple map to give a very realistic looking fern. Um, these are mountains created within a computer graphic system using a chaotic map to produce something which looks complicated, even though it's an iteration of simple rules. Um, this is the Mandelbrot set. Um, or a bit of it, um, which is again created by um, iterating a map um, to produce something really wonderful and exotic, but out of simple rules. And somehow this really chimes with the human appreciation of aesthetics and beauty. Um, chaos is now increasingly used in um, engineering design. Again, it's there. You can't avoid it. It's, it's here. It's built into reality. That is chaos in the real world. Um, these are just some of the problems that I've worked on uh, with industrial and other people and engineers, uh, where understanding chaotic behavior is really, really important. Wi-Fi, I've talked about. Microwave cookers. If you design a microwave cooker using chaos, you get much better cooking because you don't get hot spots and cold spots. Okay, so modern microwave cookers actually use chaos inside them to give you better cooking patterns. Isn't that great? Um, and um, chaos, of course, is helping us understand nature. Um, so this is behavior. I put down turbulence here in the hope that one day chaos may help us understand that, but I'm not sure if it ever will. Um, um, but it is very important in, in understanding the limitations of how far we can predict weather and climate. Um, here's chaos in nature. Um, and as I've mentioned before, um, we need to understand the motion of the asteroids because it answers the most important question of all, which is, are we going to be annihilated by an asteroid hitting us in the next few years? Okay, so um, that's the end of my talk. I, I will say I believe very much that chaos is the science of the uh, 21st century, uh, along with other things like machine learning, quantum computing, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's really important in our way of understanding um, and just a bit of blatant advertising, if I'm allowed to, um, my book on the subject of climate chaos and COVID has just come out. And uh, um, if you want to read more, there's a bit in there. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, Chris, thank you very much. That's the ebullient version of chaos. Uh, very entertaining and very informative. Um, do we have any, do we have a number of questions? Thank you for a wonderful talk. Where are we? Um, oh, as sorry. someone who used to work in chassis and suspension, mm. 25 years ago I tried to induce chaos theory mm. and he told me to leave the room. <laughs> um, one of the things I wanted to ask was, you said nature was um, complicated. If you made it complex, would nature then become more chaotic? That's a very, very good question. So. Um, 
Complicated to me means systems where you've got lots of degrees of freedom all acting around uh, independently. And such things genuinely are complicated. And I think human beings are genuinely complicated because there's so much going on. Um, what you sometimes see with complicated things is the emergence of simpler things. And those are things that we can study. Um, and that lies at the heart of a lot of chaos theory. Um, turbulence, harder to say. That might be nature being complicated. So complicated just means lots of things happening um, all at once. So where complicated becomes chaotic is very, very hard to say. But we're going to have a talk this afternoon about complexity, so maybe we'll learn more. Thank you. And the second row, the one there, and then... Uh, first, a, a tiny comment. Laplace didn't mention the momenta in his de devil's thing. He just uh, asked for the positions, not the momenta as well. So the, he needed more information. Yeah. But the question I have is the following. Uh, stimulated by knowing I was going to hear your talk and Poincaré's discovery, the three-body problem is uh, chaotic, as, you, as he mm. discovered. Is that, though, because he considered situations in which the solutions remain in a bounded region in phase space? Because, in fact, if that's not the case, the three-body problem looks completely different. In zero energy, zero angular momentum, uh, there is an unpredictable period, but the rest is completely determined. You always get a Kepler pair and a singleton going in the opposite direction. So I wonder whether a whole lot of the question around chaos, and I think all the examples you've given, it's closely associated with the fact that you're talking about a dynamical system that can, uh, the solutions of which are only accessing a bound, uh, a region of phase space with bounded Liouville measure, and that it's completely different if, you've, if that's not the case. Um, absolutely correct what you say. So uh, when you write down a nonlinear system of equations, that, that nonlinear system can have many different types of solution. So, I mean, it's perfectly well example. So here we have the double pendulum in a very, very stable configuration. Okay, it's not going to do anything else. So that is a solution of the double pendulum. Um, there's the periodic solution. Um, here's another periodic solution. Um, there is a periodic solution. I'm not sure if I can quite do it, but that, if, you, if, if, I, if I did it properly, that would be periodic. And you also have chaotic solutions as well. Um, and, and we see this in virtually everything, that, that systems can have bounded chaotic behaviour, periodic behaviour, stationary behaviour, or go off to infinity. Um, the end-body problem certainly has periodic solutions. We know we're on one. Um, so I think it's just a fact of, of nature that nonlinear problems can have many different types of solution. Here we had one. Yeah. Yes, hello. I, I absolutely love the talk. Thank you very much. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently is about the role of probability in, I guess, mm. stochastic systems. Yes. And actually, it's easy to find things that look chaotic mm. in what we would call stochastic differential yes, equations. Yes. So I wondered if, on the other side, the non-stochastic camp, whether you could talk a little bit about any well, links. I'm going to agree with you, actually. I mean, when I study climate, uh, climate has a deterministic bit. We write down the Navier-Stokes equations on that. But we also have stochasticity on top of that. Um, and one of the things you always do if you make a prediction is see, well, what happens if you add in stochasticity as well? Does that change, change things? And, Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, so nature always has a degree of indeterminacy associated with everything does. I mean, we, at the quantum level, we know this. Um, and as I say in climate, we, we're never quite sure what clouds are going to do. Um, so any system has a, has, has a mix of chaotic, which is unpredictability coming from the deterministic bits, and a stochastic bit as well, and the two interact with each other. So absolutely right. In a very self-indulgent way, he threw something rather unhelpful into the equation, which um, is very typical of humanities people. Um, I got interested in what I call structural intuitions as something that occurred in art and in science. That is to say, this enormous propensity we have for sorting out orders, sometimes very powerful, like the amount we do with human faces and otherwise less. And Einstein talks about intuition in this. And the intuition of order was the somatic thing. And there's clearly evolutionary 
work, things at work here which allow us to look at this very complex environment and get out structurally necessary things. And then thinking in the light of complexity, unpredictability, in a way being able to do that is not an evolutionary imperative, it's an intellectual mathematical imperative. There's a certain point at which you have to throw computers at it in a way which the human mind just can't do because we're not evolutionary programmed to do it. So I'm not quite sure what your question is, though. <laughs> uh, the, the question is, does this sound like nonsense? <laughs> not, not at all. But, I mean, um, clearly I mean, e evolution has produced some very organised things, namely us. Um, so, again, the whole thing about dynamical systems is that sometimes you get chaotic behaviour, sometimes you get very regular behaviour, but it's all there in the same equations. Um, and throwing a computer at something doesn't mean we're switching our brains off, it's just uh, an extra way of understanding things. Um, hi Chris, that was a, a great talk. I just wanted to make a comment about Lorentz and, and what sort of drove him towards the equations which he, which he ultimately ended up with. And that was that he was being bugged by his colleagues at MIT in the statistics department who said that weather forecasting is really very simple if you just use statistics. You just go back, look at your weather maps from, a past, you know, from the past, find a, a day where the weather map looks similar to today's, and your prediction for two weeks into the future is just whatever happened two weeks after your analog weather map. And of course, he felt, you know, they completely misunderstood the, uh, the complexities of, of weather. And, but the problem is, he, you know, he, well, even today we couldn't do this, but especially in those days, integrating Navier-Stokes was just a non-starter. So he was dr driven by trying to find a simple system that would not have periodic behavior, wouldn't repeat itself, because that, he felt, would be the ultimate way of showing these people that, uh, that, that this is not the way nature works. So, he, you know, he, he chose on these um, uh, convection equations um, and I think, you know, probably all of his colleagues said, you're wasting your time. If you, if you get it down to a, a set of equations which you can actually run on a 1960s computer, they'll just be so simple, they're bound to be periodic. And it's extraordinary how the insight he had to fight against that. Um, but anyway, he came up with his three equations and, you know, his first uh, plots of it showed indeed it, it was not repeating itself. I always find it slightly strange that he didn't quite link non-periodicity with, with sensitivity to initial conditions. And I'm never quite sure whether the story of him coming in one day and finding this exponential di divergence is slightly apocryphal, because I, I suspect he, he had realized that if he had found non-periodic behavior, it would also be non-predictable. But it was, anyway, the point it was he was very driven by this kind of, you know, proving the statistical people wrong that the non-linear systems don't, don't necessarily have periodic uh, behavior. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. I was, this is Tim Palmer, who's this great expert uh, in... Uh, Neutrology. Rather funny little, uh, little link between weather and genetics. Mm. This is a historian's one that Mendel, who, as you know, did the, the P problem and the recessive genes and so on, he, he's often taken as being a, a, a monk who was good at gardening. He was actually trained by Doppler in Vienna, and Mendel's probably greatest claim to fame is one of the international pioneers of weather forecasting isobars and so on. And of course he's a mathematician and for once you get a mathematician going into biology and find it and the rest of them didn't understand what he was doing. But he took a statistical method I mean, he started with Doppler and having been interested in weather forecasting he was able to apply that to the behaviour of what we now see genetic material. No, so he wasn't yeah. just a, a monk then, he had a trained mathematician. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, well the Abbey of St Thomas in, was um, uh, a hotbed, it was a centre for pomology for growing apples. Hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah, daft little footnote. Hello? Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, so, okay, um, for, numer uh, for equations that you can solve numerically for short periods of time, hmm. um, would it be possible to improve the predictions uh, if you had more computational power or more information? Or is there an, like a mathematical limit that prevents you from doing better um, than you already are? 
That, that's a, a, a lovely question. Um, the, the answer I'm going to give you, actually, is, is my kind of career, in a way, um, which is the answer is better algorithms. So when we're computing a chaotic system on uh, a computer, we, we try to use algorithms which understand the nature of the equations we're using. So if I was solving that, I'd use a thing called a symplectic computer. Um, which gives you a very much better way. Um, there's always going to be a limitation with any computation with rounding error. That's how well we can represent numbers. And those numbers, errors, will accumulate later on. Um, but you can show results like the ergodic properties of the strange attractor will be exactly reproduced if you use these fancy algorithms. So it's not just a question of throwing more computing power at it. It's, it's getting the algorithms as well. I think we'll take one more question. The compact one and then... Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a great talk. So I was intrigued by, uh, so when you mentioned the logistic map and yeah. you had another uh, dynamical system where you had a discontinuous yes. uh, map. So, so that, to me, that sounds like a very different way of generating chaos. Because yes. if the particle falls right near discontinuity, you mm -hmm. can end up in two very yeah. different places. So I'm wondering, are there a classification of the different ways you can generate chaos? A absolutely, and um, um, risk of being conceited, you can read my book on the subject. <laughs> uh, so discontinuous maps very naturally generate chaos, and uh, in car suspensions, that you end up with discontinuous maps. Um, so uh, there's a whole area of chaotic behavior associated with discontinuous maps. Uh, and in a sense, it's more common in those, for example, the reasons that, that you, you suggested. Thank you very much. Okay.